Our next guest is a fellow Wharton graduate, David Evan McMullen, but his friends just call him Evan. He's a former chief policy director for the House Republican Conference and a former CIA officer. And yesterday, he announced he was running as an independent candidate for president. And today, he joins us here in the studio. Evan McMullen, thank you for coming. But before we get started, we just want to show you, you're seeing this for the first time. I am. What Donald Trump said today in, Cal in North Carolina. Great. Hillary wants to abolish, essentially abolish, the Second Amendment. By the way, and if she gets to pick, if she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know. Her, her camp, his campaign says he was talking about mobilizing Second Amendment voters. What do you think of that? Oh, I, I, look, I think it's time to start calling a spade a spade with Donald Trump. We know what he means when he refuses to condemn uh, David Duke and other white supremacists. We know what he means when he suggests that his supporters should take violent action against those who oppose him politically. And I think we know what he means when he says, when he suggests that gun owners should take some violent action towards, uh, towards Hillary or whoever it was. There's no doubt that's what he, to you, that, that, that was a joke, but that's what he meant, no doubt? Look, I, I believe that, uh, look, it's clear, it, it, seems, it seems fairly clear to me. I mean, this is just what kind of guy he is. It's, it's uh, consistent with his pattern and consistent with the kind of things, his rhetoric, the kind of things he does. So uh, it's just more Donald Trump, but that's just the tip of the iceberg with him. Okay, we want to talk to you about policy. You're obviously new to every, almost everybody in yeah. America. You were a policy director. I want to start by asking you about an issue that's been big in our politics for the last couple of years, same-sex marriage. Sure. It's happened very quickly mm -hmm. uh, that it's now legal. Are you comfortable with the way it's happened and, and the, the current state of the law of the land on same-sex marriage? Well, my position on that is uh, that as a, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, I, I believe in traditional marriage between a man and a woman. but. I respect the decision of the court, and I think it's time to move on. Along those lines, you said that you want to push a lot from the federal level down to the state level. Yeah. Is that something you think should be handled by the states and not the federal government? Ideally, yes, uh, but it's been handled by the Supreme Court, and that's, that's where it is. But are you saying your personal preference is that marriage should be only legal between a man and a woman, but not just you accept the court, but that you're fine with the change? It's this. This is a decision of faith for me. It, it's something of faith for me. But my faith isn't everybody else's faith, and I make my decisions for me on those kinds of things. So, so you're and personally opposed to it, but you're 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 comfortable with the law of the land. In other words, you wouldn't, for instance, try to appoint justices, nominate justices who would overturn the decision. I, I wouldn't on that. Yeah. Um, let's say you were president, and there was intelligence that suggested an opportunity for American forces to kill the head of Syria, Assad. Would you authorize him to be killed by U.S. forces if you could do that? Well, well, let's just say this: the, it, we, if we wanted to do that, we could do that now. I, I don't, I don't think that's a decision. That's a strategic decision that I think is uh, driven by 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 a strategy. If we had one, um, I don't think that's the, that's the that's the the issue. There is not that. We can't find him. It's not like we're. Okay, it's not like Bin Laden. I assume, where we're I assume trying you agree with the current president. You'd like him gone. I do. I think he. So why not? Why not have U.S. forces kill him? Well, I think you have to have a number of things in place. But I think he. I think Assad should go. I think. I don't think we can allow him to stay there if we ever to hope. If we ever hope to defeat ISIS, uh, one thing that I hope ever the world understands uh, is that. Dictators create terrorists. So that's something that we all have to understand. Now, Donald Trump will say, well, Saddam Hussein was very good at killing terrorists, so that was at least something that was good with him. Well, Saddam Hussein creates and other, ter and other dictators create terrorists. They create extremists. Along those lines, you yeah. said in one of your earlier interviews that as a former CIA operative, mm -hmm. you would be doing things very different when it comes to ISIS that what yeah. either, either President Kennedy's suggestion. Give us one or two or three things mm -hmm. that you suggest you come from a very different place in fighting ISIS yeah. that nobody's talking about. Two, two enormous things uh, are different uh, with uh, President Obama and, and my, uh, my view on what should be done. The first thing is we need to take the fight to ISIS on the battlefield in a much more serious way. That includes more serious airstrikes, includes working with indigenous forces on the ground, developing them, taking a proact proactive role in that regard. Uh, it includes uh, better aligning, coming up with a strategy, first of all. We need a comprehensive strategy to defeat ISIS. Um, and that should be done in, in concert with our allies. Now, there, there have been issues between 
the Obama, the Obama administration and our allies because they don't agree on how, it, how we should go about destroying ISIS. And that's, that's meant that the, some of the allies aren't as engaged in, in the effort as, they, as we need them to be, frankly. So the second thing, just to, to finish that, uh, the second thing is we really need to do a better job at fighting the ideology of, of radical Islamists. This is a battle, as much as it is a battle uh, on the battlefield, traditionally, it's a battle of ideas, and we're doing a terrible job in that regard. Let me ask you about two issues that have been yeah. long part of the conservative movement. One is mm -hmm. personal savings accounts, private savings accounts as part of Social Security. You support that? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I support most conservative solutions to reforming our entitlement programs. Including that one. I'm not going to say necessarily that I am supporting that officially as a part of my positioning on reforming entitlements. But look, the entitlements are, are, are pushing us further and further into debt. They're growing our, 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 our deficits are larger and larger. Our debts are larger and larger. We've got to do something to get them on a sustainable path. Now, we've got to keep our commitments to our, our elderly, uh, our seniors today, but we've got to make, we've got to phase in some reforms. For future that, retirees. For, for future retirees, we just have to do it. And Donald Trump says he promises not to do that. Actually, you know, that's, a, that's a promise that he makes publicly, but privately he says different things. Uh, he's not being honest with the American people about that. We absolutely do have to, to do that. I'll just say that we are on track to be spending more on debt service payments, interest payments, in about 10 years than we currently spend on defense. That's, that's a huge, huge problem. One last policy question yep. to go to break. Vouchers. Mm -hmm. allow kids in, in, in any school to take the money, the public money, and bring it to a parochial yeah. school or, or charter school, private school. Do you support that? Absolutely. And the reason why I support it is because I see it as a way for, um, for, for children that are growing up in low-income families or in, in families that are below the poverty line uh, to have a chance. I mean, this is just such a critical thing. We need to, our educational system is 100 years old. It was made for a time when we were transitioning from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. We've got to, we've got to have a new updated educational system in a variety of ways, but I think that's an, a very important one. Before people are just getting to know you, we talked about some of your ideas before. Let's talk about you a little bit more. Sure. Is it true, as I heard you say in an interview with Hugh Hewitt, that you, while you were in college, you started working with the CIA? That's right. How'd that start? When I was in college, I wasn't with the CIA. <laughs> well, I, I became interested as, as a young man in working for the CIA when my dad brought home a spy film on a VHS cassette, by the way. Well, do you remember the film? Yeah, Three Days of the Condor. It's uh, a Redford great movie, film. For Abs sure. yeah, yeah, one of the best. So there are a lot of spy films that are made every year, in my view. That's a lot of things with of payphones that yeah that's right <laughs> payphones used to be very important yeah. for spies yeah. no longer but uh, but yeah I, that movie captivated my attention but how did it start did how they does contact actually you happen? yeah did, did they you did contact they them get this call yeah well well it's important so I started reading all kinds of books right about the CIA a couple years later I was still in high school I called the agency and asked if there was anything I could do I got in touch with a recruiter we would stay in touch for a number of years after that I uh, you know spent some finished high school went on a Mormon mission started college and eventually while I was in college then then the hiring process started and uh, I would do a semester at BYU and a semester back in did Washington. Your roommates the know? They did know yeah because at that time actually I wasn't undercover yeah. uh, it was only after I graduated that I then went undercover and went through training and then on to serve. We haven't had a president uh, since George H.W. Bush who served uh, in the army you served in. Do you ever kill anybody? You know, I served in war zones and in conflict zones, and uh, part of our role uh, at the agency was to uh, el eliminate threats and eliminate those who were posing threats to the country. Uh, my role was to learn about the intentions of Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups and the, the whereabouts of, of their operatives, and, uh, and then to assist efforts to take them off the battlefield or one way or another. Is that a yes? I, I don't think answering that kind of question is, a, is directly is the thing for me to do. But um, I worked very hard and, and served the country honorably and everywhere I went. You're asking people to vote for you as an unknown. And just, I just want to go back to what Donnie just asked you. you. You had a lot of very intense experiences. It's obvious from the kind of assignments. <coughs> you were doing some pretty intense stuff. You're not known to people. Mm -hmm. Do you not feel you need to be more open about the kind of things you went through as a young man to give people a sense of your life experience mm -hmm. and the kind of pressures you faced? No, I, I would love to. Yeah, I'm, I believe I'm totally open. I, I'm happy to answer anything. Well, yeah, he asked you a direct question. Yeah, no, it's good. I just, you know, sometimes, uh, 
sometimes veterans who have served are asked questions like that when they're running for president, and then they brag about killing people, and it just seems off to me, frankly. Um, I, I just, with all due respect, yeah. I don't think we either of us are asking you to brag about it. We're just mm -hmm. trying to get a sense of the kinds of things mm -hmm. you did. That's a pretty awesome responsibility okay. for Fair. someone on behalf of the United well, States. Let me try to share a little more information and see if it satisfies you. I certainly located terrorists, and those terrorists were either arrested or sometimes killed. That's, that's what happened. So that's, you know, other, other details like that, I don't know if, if they're important to share, but this is what we do overseas. This is what uh, Central Intelligence Agency operations officers do, and this is, this is the role. Uh, just like our, our soldiers are, are tasked with going out and, and uh, facing the enemy on the battlefield in a very traditional way, intelligence officers in, in combat zones or in hostile zones um, are operating sort of in the backgrounds doing somewhat similar things but more quietly when necessary against top leaders of terrorist organizations and others. But these are things that are known and if, if you know that I served as an operations officer in the Central Intelligence Agency then you can imagine if I'm serving in war zones that these are the kinds of things I did. But these are not things and I, I understand that you're not asking me to brag about that and I don't mean to suggest that. I'm simply saying that um, it's unfortunate that this kind of work has to be done at all in the world. It is, it is necessary, the work of a central intelligence agency uh, operative is necessary as, as the work of a soldier, um, but, um, but it's unfortunate and it's not something that I enjoy per se talking about. Um, I'm going to just pretend I was helping you on your campaign here. Yeah. You seem, I'm talking to you the first time as we are, you seem like a really good guy, a guy that I'd want to go into business with. Yeah. Tell me why, without talking about the other candidates, you're fit to be president. I mean, you seem like a really smart 40-year-old guy that has served this country, that has worked in the banking business, somebody I'd love to sit next to at a dinner party, mm -hmm. somebody I would invest if you came to start a business. Mm -hmm. But as I'm sitting here, tell me why I would vote for you. I don't want to talk about the other candidates. What makes you qualified? Yeah, absolutely. This is what makes me qualified. One of the biggest challenges this country faces is the threat of Islamist terrorism. I am the only credible candidate who has any experience whatsoever, firsthand, fighting terrorists. I know exactly what needs to be done to defeat ISIS and other such groups. And on day one, I can start that process. I have a hundred percent confidence in that. I have zero doubt this is my wheelhouse. And I look at my, my competitors, Donald Trump, everything he says about the topic is absolutely silly and in fact damaging to, the, to, the, to our effort. And with regard to Hillary Clinton, under her tenure at the, at the, at the State Department, she presided over ISIS's and, and, uh, and, and the uh, Islamic or the Al Qaeda in Iraq's resurgence. So that was what happened while she was there. So the idea that she would then be the person to go destroy them, I think, is, is flawed. I am the only person with this experience. I'm the only person who knows how to work with the military, the intelligence services, and law enforcement to get it done. The second thing is this. Well, there are two more things. The second thing is that my time, at, uh, my time in the private sector taught me. I worked with a variety of companies in a variety of different sectors. I learned what it takes for them to, to thrive in a global economy. And why that's important is because they need to thrive so that we have jobs here in America. That's another challenge that the American people are facing. We've got to get back to business. We've got, our companies need to start thriving even more so than they are now so that we can get Americans better paying jobs. Now lastly, the, the thing I'll say is that I've spent the last nearly four years working in Congress at senior levels. I've seen from the inside what's wrong with our system. Broadly speaking, it's that too much power is in Washington, located far away from the American people, so that the American people, the average hardworking American, has almost, it has, has little say in what happens in the government. This has to change, and it changes by shifting more power from the executive branch back to the legislative branch, Congress, where it rightfully belongs, and more power back to the states. This is, these are the things I know, and these are three major challenges that this country faces. Is it true that you had on your Twitter profile that you worked at Goldman Sachs and that was replaced by just saying businessman? Is that true? That that oh, I, I'm not sure I'll have to check. I'm no longer managing my social media. Are you proud of having worked for Goldman Sachs? I, I'm proud of what I learned at Goldman Sachs, absolutely. So. Are, well, well, go ahead. I mean, they, yeah. they've been in this campaign already because <laughs> Heidi, Heidi Cruz worked there. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you think, do, what do you think of people who criticize their role in our economy? Look, I think Americans feel like they're not being heard in our current system. And they feel like banks and other major financial organizations have some kind of fast uh, or, or inside track on, in our system. That's the real problem. We've got to make sure that Americans... But is there some validity to that argument? In other words, I think so. people at Goldman Sachs get really rich. I, look, I, I think so, but I think, I think we've got to be careful because we need banks and we need a strong financial sector so that our entire economy thrives and grows. I mean, we just have to have it. So what's the valid about the criticism of Goldman Sachs? Well, I, I don't necessarily think that the criticism of Goldman Sachs specifically is is valid, but I would say of the financial sector, of banks in general, that maybe undue risks w were taken with people's uh, with people's retirements, essentially, uh, in uh, before the crash, and and I think we have to look at that, and we have to to. to ensure that that doesn't happen again and some of that is driven by by greed and there are issues associated with all of that but but uh, but let me tell you about my experience at Goldman I worked with companies in the healthcare sector in the industrial sector in the technology sector consumer packaged products and others and I, I, I met with CFOs and CEOs and other uh, other members of the management team in those management teams in those companies and I learned directly from them what challenges they were facing and what business models they needed to succeed in the in Speaking the Speaking of challenges, yeah. you, let's go over your to-do list as a presidential candidate. You've got a yeah. fundraisers. Oh, vice president. Who's on that short list? Well, I'm not ready to share who's on that short list yet. We'll, we'll share the decision when it comes out. But I'll tell you what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm looking for somebody whose interests are aligned with those of the American people. I think that's something that's been lost in uh, among the two major party candidates, frankly. I, I don't see that their interests are, are well aligned with those of the American people. Uh, and somebody who understands what truly makes America special. I think that's also lost. Donald Trump, for example, has no idea what makes this country special or great or however he wants to say it. He has no idea. Mark, can we end on the, the you know, I'm the, with all due respect, action news team branding expert. Yeah, let's, so we let's wanna, take we a look. We want to put your logo up there because we found that to be curious. Uh-huh. Uh, will you, that looks like that Talk could us be through for that. a vitamin or what, what's going on? A vitamin. I don't tell, what's the thinking behind that? <gasps> oh, okay, you're really putting me on the spot with this one. Well, I think the idea with the, I was told that the star and the stripe was meant to uh, suggest strength and uh, patriotism and uh, respect to the military. Mm -hmm. And I like those messages. And I like that logo, actually. What, Just, what, what is that green? What color is that? I think it's blue. That's Do you blue. see green? Oh, man, this is hey, like oh, now we, now we have a yeah, problem. I was, was going to say, I see no, forest no, green. One of note us, to self, red, white, and what blue. Next time. I see blue? green. I see like no, a he, turquoise. You know, it, a, it, yeah. does, it shows up on your screen as green. But it's meant to be blue? It shows up on, on my computer screen as blue. Are we going to go in a second. But I, yeah. I'm asking you all day off camera about your family. How are they reacting yeah. to this? Uh, you got they, three, two sisters and a brother? Two sisters and a brother. So your parents are both alive, live in the Seattle area. Indeed, right? yep. How do they feel about their, their yep. brother son running for president? Oh, I think they're pretty amused and excited and proud all at the same time. They think time. you're going to win? I haven't asked them if they think I'm going to win. I hope What's they do. What's like the body I think, language? Well, it's all been over the phone because it's moved so quickly, so I, I don't know exactly what the body language has gotta been. got to get you FaceTime. That's right. That's right. We should start using that. I believe I can win, and I believe that the American people are hungry for a new generation of leadership. Americans are highly dissatisfied with the direction of the country. They're, the negatives of the two major party candidates are sky high, historically high. It is time for a new generation of leadership that unifies this country and that puts the country before their own interests.